develop mostly uh, fundamental and mostly portfolio. The other three are usually ignored. You'll get a little flavor of those too. Number one, cyclical analysis uh, refers to major long-term secular markets. Now we're talking about commodity bull market. This is a market where the prices of commodities steadily rise for many years, typically for more than a decade. The first cycle lasted 16 years from 1906 to 1923, included World War I. The second cycle went from 33 to 53 and it went uh, for as long as 21, 22 years. The third cycle is from 68 to 82, 15 years. And the last cycle began in 1999. Sometimes it's accepted to be, has started in 2000 and still goes on. And my intelligence uh, uh, expectations based on understanding the fundamentals and other issues is that the current commodity bull market will last in between 15 and 25 uh, years. That's my expectation is that we've been in the commodity bull market for about seven or eight years and we have another seven, eight years to last at least and maybe as much as another 15 or 16 more uh, years. Hard to say but we are barely still not even in the middle of this commodity uh, bull market. Well, why are commodity bull markets so important? And the answer is because gold keeps up with commodity prices. The ratio you see here from roughly 1914, the beginning of World War I, all the way to 2000, the ratio between <coughs> gold and commodities, where commodities is represented by CRB, Commodity Research Bureau Index, which is an index of 15 equally weighted commodities, has been floating between half and roughly two. This simply means that uh, when gold is underperforming, it underperforms by about twice all the other commodities. And when gold is outperforming, it's outperforming by twice. Well, in a commodity bull market, it will not be uncommon for commodity prices to rise 10, 15 or 20 times. And therefore, gold will rise approximately as uh, much. Now, you can also see a very different type of uh, view. Uh, instead of gold versus other commodities, which it keeps its ratio in between half and two, now you have gold versus Dow Jones. And Dow Jones is symbolic of paper assets or financial assets. Of course, it is a, an index of stocks. And gold is symbolic of real assets or commodities. And you can see that gold will vary widely. So the ratio simply tells you how many ounces of gold are needed to buy one unit of the index. And you can see here at the beginning of, uh, of the cycle, here in 1920, over here, uh, the ratio went up uh, roughly, I don't know, from 2 to almost 20. This simply means that Dow Jones outperformed gold 10 times. So you, bought, you, you put in 1,000 in gold, you put in 1,000 in Dow Jones. Gold would remain the same. Dow Jones will go up 10 times. But in 1929, if you put in thousand in Dow Jones and thousand in gold, you will see that the ratio moves from 20 to 2, which simply means that gold outperformed 10 times Dow Jones. The point to understand is that there are cycles which where for 10, 15 years, financial assets and stocks dramatically outperform gold. And then there are cycles for which gold dramatically outperforms uh, uh, financial assets. It is important to understand in which cycles you're currently, cycle you're currently investing in order to know what or how to outweigh your portfolio. In other words, now if you were in 1940, you want to underweight gold and you want to be investing in Dow Jones as Dow Jones will be clearly outperforming. And from 1966 
all the way to 1980, sometimes 1982, you will have that gold outperformed from roughly 25 down to 1. Gold outperformed the stock market 25 times, 25 times. And then if you invested in 1980, you'll see that from a ratio of 1 all the way to a ratio of 45, Dow Jones or the stock market outperformed gold by 25 times. Well, finally, when you look from the beginning of 2000, the trend has moved on the way down. And my expectation is that it will slide through all the way to 2 or 1. In other words, based on cyclical analysis, my educated, uh, intelligent guess, based on history, at least 100 years of history, is that from here on, investing in gold and investing in the stock market, gold will outperform at least 10 times the stock market. Now, it could be that the stock market will fall five times and gold will go up only two. But it could be that the stock market will triple and gold will go up 30 times. Again, all I'm saying is that the ratio Oh, good. Uh, that gold will outperform the stock market 10 times more. I'm not saying in absolute values because we don't know how much inflation will power the stock market higher and then multiply by 10 for gold. Uh, any questions here on this chart? Is it, is it fairly clear? Does it make sense? Uh, what is it? Uh, questions? Anybody? Is it clear? All right, let's see what's next. All right, well, this is one example of one particular cycle, not the complete cycle. The cycle only is measured from 1970 June all the way to 1980. The cycle began a little earlier than that in 66 or 67. So there is, uh, the, the very beginning has been cut off, but nevertheless, you see how things performed for that particular fixed period. Number one was oil, 35% almost. Number two was gold, 32%. U.S. coins overall, 27%. Silver, 24%. And you can go down and must notice the very bottom. Stocks, barely 6.1. So you picked the wrong investment cycle and you're guaranteed that stocks will perform the worst. Post stamps perform better than stocks. That's important to understand. And of course, the second biggest loser was bonds. Of course, stocks and bonds are both representing, representing financial assets. So, during a commodity boom where commodity prices rise, means inflation is rising, in inflationary times, uh, inflation eats away the value of stocks, eats away the value of bonds, and these are the distinct losers, by far the sure guaranteed losers. From the winners, you always have two top picks, oil and gold. It depends on where you begin and where you start investing. But then again, uh, when you're making 32%, whether you're making 32 or 34, it is not as relevant as, you know, two more percents, no big deal. Is it in your possession? Do you have a control over it? I mean, you have uh, tons of other considerations than just maximizing to extract two more percent, right? And make it 32 percent, a 34 uh, percent. I can discuss a lot more about that, but I like to move. Number one, so now I'm switching from cyclical analysis where I showed you how gold performs relative to other real assets and then relative to financial assets. Now we're moving to completely different analysis, fundamental analysis. Well, supply of gold is fairly fixed. Over 5,000 years we've mined whatever we've mined. In one year we mine less than 1% of the overall stock of gold. So, supply of gold is fairly steady, fairly stable, and changes very little. Well, that is also the reason why its value is the most stable of all other assets in the world, because its supply is phenomenally stable. So, we are interested uh, in gold analysis almost exclusively 
on demand. So, number one, uh, fundamental analysis tells us that, under the, that gold is undervalued relative to financial assets. This is from the previous chart that I showed you with uh, Dow Jones. Number one, smart money. These are highly sophisticated investors like George Soros and Warren Buffett. I mean, these names should be familiar, right? These are the guys that are smart money that are buying gold. So smart money buys gold before big institutions because they are smarter in some way or better connected, whatever. We have been observing smart money buying gold for the last three, four, five years or so. Now there is an, a, a new demand, fresh demand coming from big money. And big money are professional, major financial uh, fund managers associated with uh, managing insurance money, managing pension money, managing mutual fund money, managing hedge funds, hedge funds money. So all of these major institutions finally in 2007, especially since the beginning of the credit crunch, are beginning to enter the gold market and beginning to recognize that gold is actually okay to invest in. Well, no wonder that gold went up 50% from $650 to $1,000 in six or seven months. Of course, when big money begins to enter, of course, the price is bound to explode. But the point is, they have barely invested two or three percent of their assets. So they still have a lot more money to buy. And as they get scared from bonds, stocks, in general inflation, in currencies, they are bound to get further and further into buying gold. Well, next one I kind of uh, mentioned, rising inflationary expectations. Now everyone is understanding that prices will keep rising. So people are finally realizing we'd better hedge our uh, money with some sort of inflation hedge. So no better in head inflation hedge has been so far found by history or otherwise than gold. If you're expecting prices to rise, you're guaranteed that gold will keep up with them and eventually outperform uh, them. So it's going to uh, run faster than them. Currency hedge. Well, there has been major currency market instability. There has been major volatility in markets. And as currency traders and others get to get a little bit scary, it's called skittish in English. As they get skittish, they say, well, we might as well buy some gold. At least its value is a lot more stable than that of the yen or whatever, the British pound, the euro, etc. Of course, it is a crisis hedge and this is known as safe haven demand. So when in times of crisis, you'd better put your money in something safe. Nothing has been found safer than gold itself. Now it is also understood that gold is an excellent alternative asset. So, so far people knew only stocks, bonds and real estate. Well, now people are beginning to realize that we actually got to eat and it takes bread and bread takes wheat. So commodities like wheat become important, like crude oil become important. So suddenly people realize that there is this commodity world and within the commodity world, the symbol representing all commodities is gold itself. All right. What else? Uh, central banks have been uh, suppressing uh, the price of gold. This is how GATA, G-A-T-A is spelled, becomes .org, O-R-G, and you can get the website if you want a whole lot more. I don't have the time today to discuss this issue. This requires another meeting altogether. Central banks have been selling a lot of their gold uh, uh, reserves. Well, they have already ended their sales this year, well, last year in 2007. And now you're actually seeing the most powerful of all buyers in the world, and these are central banks themselves. Russia's central banks have been buying big time. Russians aren't that stupid. They're buying big. 
and Qatar apparently has been buying a lot of gold, of course, relative to their portfolio. And Chinese central bank is buying big too, although through in, in channels which are hiding the link through them, through some Australian funds, some Hong Kong funds, some Singaporean funds. So these are some sort of investment funds buying gold, but behind these funds stands China's central bank. You understand the Chinese have one and a half trillion dollars and they gotta buy something with them because these dollars are depreciating. They hate to lose money because Bush prints more dollars and they hate to finance Bush's wars. So they would gotta move the, this, these dollars into something else and gold is one of their top priorities. I mean, you can buy only so much oil in Sudan and elsewhere, so what else are you going to put your money in once you bought all the, bo all the oil in the world? Well, you're going to be start buying some gold, as they have been uh, doing. All right, you've seen also some uh, rising jewelry and consumer demand. You've also seen some rising fabrication demand. You've also seen some safe haven investment demand. I don't want to go into uh, gore, the gory details. Uh, you have some falling dollar concerns. You have ger general currency volatility. Now you're experiencing financial market instability concerns. You also have political fears, war fears, economic recessionary fears. This comes from you know the previous stuff. You also have another big player. Actually, it's a couple of dozen of big players. Sovereign wealth funds. These are United Arab Emirates, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. These are oil exporting countries and countries with uh, current account surpluses. Japan will be one, Korea will be another, where they got tens and more likely hundreds of billions of dollars and they have to invest in something. Well, you gotta understand your Saudi Arabia you're not going to be buying oil. It's a little bit dumb to buy oil. I mean, they already got all the oil in the world. What else are they going to buy? Well, they can buy so many horses, so many Ferraris, right, and Lamborghinis, so much land, and then what else is left to buy? And that is gold. I mean, you got to understand, these guys have hundreds of billions, and I understand women have the propensity to spend, and maybe you could spend a million easily. I don't doubt that. But, you know, I'll, you know anyone can give you a billion, and you're going to be in deep trouble. You can't just spend a billion a whole life, even if you want to, no matter how lavish your lifestyle. I mean, it's an awful lot of money. And these guys don't have a billion. I mean, they have like, you know, 100 billion, right? <laughs> so you gotta say it's a big, big problem altogether. When you have 100 billion, you gotta spend it well, right? <laughs> Not just waste it on some stuff. All right, so what else do we have? Oh, rising institutional demand. I already mentioned that one. Um, overall investment demand has been huge, like 300 million ounces. This is pretty much for the last six or seven years, it's like Whatever has been overall gold produced and mined uh, throughout history, has, there has been that much investment buying over the last six years. Well, you ask, well, how is it possible to buy even more gold than has been mined? The answer is some investor bought it. Two years later, that investor is running, say, 100% return. He doubled his money. He sold it to some other investment. So there has been a reseller, reselling from investing investors to investors, which is some sort of double uh, counting. Now, gold investors own more than half of the world's gold. And also, uh, gold investors, meaning retail guys, are typically uh, long-term buy and hold investors. You know, an investor buys, like you, me, whatever, a uh, gold coin, they might usually hold it for 10, 20, 50 years. Yesterday I told the example where my grandfather worked in the US in the 30s during the Great Depression. He brought the gold coin, you know, he gave it to you know, my grandmother, then to my mother, and now my father gave it to me, and it's been in our family for 70 years. And nobody sold it, and I don't plan on selling it anytime soon. So, 
Those type of investors are extremely long term. They buy it once, it's out of the market, okay? That's very important. So supply is, meaning for sale to investors, is rapidly shrinking as gold is moving from weak hands to strong hands. Strong hands are those that once they buy it, they don't have to sell it next week or next month. They can put it away for a decade or two and don't have to uh, use it again. Now, one of the most important factors in gold demand today is, at least potential, is that only one or two percent of all world liquid assets in the forms of stocks, bonds, mutual funds, cash, bank deposits, is currently invested in gold. So, all you need to do is a shift of 2% of all world liquid assets. That's like nothing. And this will double the overall uh, percentage from 2% to 4% and the price of gold could easily skyrocket based on this little shift of portfolio investment from 2% to 3 or 4%. Uh, percent. Uh, any questions?